welcome everyone to our morning session. Um, right now, please have a round of applause to welcome Mr. Joshua James. Um, he's the manager, a director of MSC Van Fook International Bilingual Schools in Ho Chi Minh City. And with more than a decade of work experience in Vietnam, he has a strong track record innovating global citizenship education across elementary, secondary, and tertiary in Vietnam. He also advocates partnership between education and industry. And he's the co-founder of the 8-Bit Content. Um, his work for education and human capital development initiatives for Vietnam have included um, collaborations with the Hanoi Department of Education and Training, the World Bank, Harvard Business School, and the British Embassy. So give a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. So guys, nice to meet you. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. And I want to make it clear, too, this presentation is not about me. Okay, This presentation is about you guys. It's about Vietnam. But before I get started, I think it's important for you to have an understanding about where I'm coming from. Like, why am I talking about what it is that I'm talking about? And like, where do these ideas that I'm going to share come from? So um, I am uh, I'm from Canada. <clears throat> I came to Asia 13 years ago. Uh, I studied uh, to be a school teacher in Canada. So I was a qualified teacher. I could be teaching in a school in Canada if I wanted to. Um, and somehow I ended up in Malaysia working in a school. And that school invested into Hanoi, invested into uh, British University of Vietnam. I don't know if you know that one. BUV. Okay, so this organization invested in BUV, and so they sent me to Hanoi uh, 10 years ago to help set up BUV. <clears throat> so from there, um, I got involved on uh, the business side. I also had an MBA coming to Vietnam. So uh, I got in, BUV was, is a, primarily a business university. So I helped to kind of organize some of the business side of it and also create like pathways for marketing to get students into the, into the university from the early days. Um, and from there, it kind of led me into getting involved in the business community. Uh, and I became a board member. Do you know Eurocham? Have you heard of Eurocham? So I've been on the board of Eurocham twice. I've been elected to the board of Eurocham. And I'm on the board of the British Chamber of Commerce also. So this has meant that like, even though I came from an education background, I've become really knee deep on the business side, the business side in Vietnam. And the reason why I'm saying all this is not just like say it, but this is the stuff that I do, but is that like, Having worked, like been educated in education and in business, and then working in education and in business in Vietnam, I've seen that there's challenges on both sides, and that the challenges on both sides need to be fixed, and that the solutions involve a lot of cooperation, which doesn't really happen right now. Okay. So basically, I started off on all this thing. I started off as a school teacher, moved into universities, and now I'm the managing director of a school, a big school in Ho Chi Minh City. We have 1,500 kids, and it's four years old. So it's a fairly new school. So what I want to talk about today is about how we develop global citizenship education. The method, the model that we're going to be taking at our school, the one that we've started, to try to help develop skills of students so that they're global citizens. And every school talks about global citizens, right? But at the same time, so many employers complain that students lack soft skills, and students lack this, and students lack that when they come out of university. And what do they usually do? They usually work with the university. 
So if, if I can summarize basically in 10 seconds what it is that I'm going to talk about, give you a very short version of what I'm going to talk about today, is that like businesses and organizations are working a lot with universities to try to develop students to have soft skills when they graduate. But students need to have those skills before they get to university. You can't turn that on in four years. You need to turn that on before that happens. And universities and businesses communicate a lot, but businesses and organizations and schools don't communicate a lot. And so schools have to guess what are the things that need to be done, and businesses don't even think about how they can be communicating with schools to help fix this problem. So basically that's what I'm going to talk about. But what is the approach that we're trying to take to address that so that we're not waiting for university for kids to start developing these soft skills. And soft skills is also something everybody talks about. So when I'm talking about soft skills, I think global citizenship is like, soft skills is under global citizenship. Because soft skills is like communication, teamwork, and all that type of stuff like that. But it's really about being able to communicate with people around the world, right? Being able to work with people around the world. And the people who complain the most in Vietnam about like the, the, the graduates of universities or whatever entering the workforce, are mostly uh, foreign businesses, right? Foreign businesses are the ones who are saying that there's these challenges. And so foreign businesses are the ones that like, require more global understanding from, from Vietnamese students. But also, foreign businesses need more local understanding of Vietnam, right? So that we can kind of fix that problem. Does that make sense? Yeah? Cool. And if you guys have any questions while I'm talking, please don't hesitate. Just interrupt me, raise your hand or whatever, and ask questions all you want. Okay, cool. So anyway, when I was making these slides, I wasn't really sure who the audience was going to be, so I thought, like, I got to make it really academic. But I would prefer not to be super academic if it's okay for you guys. I'd like it to be more practical. So like these slides, I might not follow these slides just because it's like I was under the impression I was going to be talking in a lecture hall full of like professors or whatever, but I'm pre I prefer that it be more practical because that's like where I'm coming from is like doing it, not theorizing and, you know, researching it, just trying to like find solutions on the ground. So anyway, what I'll do is I'll talk a little bit about the definitions. Not from an academic point, but just so that, like, when I'm talking about this stuff, you guys, we're all on the same page. Okay, so, like, we know, like, when I say this word, this is what I mean when I say this word. And not, like, leave it up to interpretation. And then I'm going to talk about uh, this idea of communities of practice. And I'll explain what that is and how we do it. And then I'm going to talk specifically about my school in Ho Chi Minh City. And my school is in Ho Chi Minh City right now, but to be honest, it's there's going to be campuses in Hanoi. And you haven't heard of Amasi yet, but you will hear of Amasi. Cool. OK, so here's the definition of global citizenship. The primary aim of global citizenship education is nurturing respect for all. So this is from uh, UNESCO. OK, and you probably, I think this is probably the standard definition that everybody is looking at. This is the particular part that I want to focus on, like in this def definition, you know, peaceful, tolerant, inclusive, secure world. Those are all values that's really important. Uh, students' active participation that address global issues of social, political, economic, or environmental nature. So global citizenship is about social, political, economic, environmental. And you, you know that they have those types of things in schools, right? They have Model UN, they have Environment Club, right? They have the Debating Club, Charity Club, right? The Student Government. They have a lot of things like this. But even though they have a lot of things like this, we still get the complaint that, like, people lack the skills when they leave university. So, okay, so how are we going to fix that? do that before I change the slide, right? That's what you guys want? Okay. So, that's the, the definition of 
global citizenship that we're following when we talk about that. Like that's we're just following the UN definition of it in this presentation. Continuous professional development. So that's a very common term in education for teachers. It's a good term. It means that you're constantly improving yourself. You can't just become a teacher and then that's it. And then you don't keep learning. Right? Can somebody tell me why you can't just become a teacher and then stop, stop learning? Yeah, exactly. Knowledge is constantly changing, right? What are some other things that are changing that require teachers to change? Students are changing. Excellent. How are students changing? Yeah, very good. So students are becoming smarter. Students are bec why are students becoming smarter? Or Yep, absolutely. Uh, you know, when you think about the last two years, the challenges that you guys have had to face, right? COVID-19, yeah. Now, what did you guys have to do to study? Study online? What does that require? Self-discipline, self right? It requires a lot of self-discipline to do that. And it requires a lot more responsibility on, on young people than ever before. Before, you know, the teacher stood over your shoulder and like gave you, but there it was online from anywhere, not able to give you the same amount of feedback. So it put more pressure on you guys. So there's two ways of looking at that. One side is like those poor, poor children, right? The other side of it is that like those fortunate children. Look how independent and resilient they've had to become. So in the long term, are they going to be at a disadvantage or are they going to be at an advantage? You know, like you can look at it two sides. Is the cup, is the cup half empty or is the cup half full? Young children are probably going to be more resilient, more independent, right? And that's a good thing. That's a good way of looking at it. So anyway, yeah, going back to the point, continuous professional development something that's really important in education because teachers need to be constantly changing because the world's constantly changing around them, right? The purpose of staff development is just not just to implement instructional innovations. Its central purpose is to build strong collaborative work cultures that will develop long-term capacity for change. So change. Continuous professional development is about making sure that your team can change. Because you can't have a school with a whole bunch of teachers and only one of those teachers is capable of changing, right? You need a community of teachers who are capable of changing. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about continuous professional development. Change is continuous. Teachers need to be able to change continuously. Society is changing constantly. And it can't be just individuals. It's got to be the whole group. It's got to be the whole school that changes with those challenges. So that's the definition. So here's a little model that I threw up there. For the, in case I had to explain this to a whole bunch of professors or whatever. Um, personal development. So what are, the act, what, are the, what are the aspects of continuing and continuous professional development? Personal development. So personal development. What could be some examples you think for personal development? Sorry? Skills development, okay, yeah, what type of skills? Yep. Yep, sure, definitely. So personal development can be self-directed by individuals, right? You know, like online, online learning as an example. You guys had to probably teach yourselves how to learn online, did you? Nobody taught you how to learn online before you had to do it. Same for a lot of schools. A lot of schools, teachers had to teach themselves how to teach online, right? Because it was like 
One day they're in the classroom, and then the next day they're online in front of a laptop. They don't know how to do it, so they had to teach it themselves. So that could be an example of personal development. I think another way of looking at personal development is about like the person, the development of the person. So if we separate the, the professional side of it and we think about the person, so fitness would be an example of personal development, right? You need to be healthy like, to be able to do your job and to be able to function. So fitness is an example of personal development. Setting goals for yourself, right? That's personal development. Like, where do you want to be in five years? That's personal development, right? So continuous professional development involves like encouraging people to set goals for themselves, encouraging people to be healthy, encouraging people to be like a whole person, right? Uh, curriculum development, developing the curriculum as the world changes, right? Before everybody was like learning with books and stuff like that, then everybody was learning on laptops. So the curriculum needs to change, right? The skills, like what I learned in school and what you guys learned in school is different, right? Because the world has changed. So the curriculum has to change. It needs to be developed. Continuing professional development means like workshops for teachers about how to teach this and how to teach that. You know, like make, taking a teacher from here and bringing them up here, which is like nobody graduates from teacher's college and they're the best teacher ever. Everybody has to like practice and study and, you know, workshops and work with their peers and blah, blah, blah. Performance management, people like me come in, watch you do your job, shout at you. No, we don't shout at you. But coaching people, right? Continuous professional development. So being coached by the manager and being put on performance plans and all that type of stuff like that. And then school improvement. So how are we going to improve the school? It depends a, a lot on all that. Does that make sense, guys? If I start to get boring, please give me a signal. And I will <laughs> make it less boring. I don't want you guys to be bored. I was told to do that, by the way. Hi. It wasn't my idea. They told me to do this every time I want to change the slide. Um, generational changes, like, like you guys were saying. The changes, generations change. So when we talk about generational change, you guys are much more familiar with technology than your parents probably, right? Because you were born with it. I spent, 20, I spent like 25 years of my life without a mobile phone. And I don't even remember what it was like <laughs> without it. I don't remember the world without cell phones. But you guys also don't remember the world without cell phones, right? Because you were born with the cell phone in your hand. I have two young children. What do I do when they start screaming and shouting? I give them the phone. <laughs> so they're digital natives. Um, online learning also showed that we can do kind of creative things, like Kids can learn at their own pace. It can be more differentiated in some ways. Some guys can do this type of thing. Other guys can do that type of thing online. So technology is helpful, but that's also a generational change because when I was a kid, it was the teacher on the writing on the blackboard, everybody copying it, quiet, you know, just like that. But now different, everybody on the laptop on Facebook while the teacher's talking, right? Higher expectations on students to take charge, like we said, COVID. Now everybody's responsible, self-directed learning, independence. Greater emphasis on and resources to deal with stress levels. You know, people didn't think that uh, depression even existed one generation ago. Now it's all we can talk about, right? Now we have school counselors. Last time we didn't have school counselors. Now we know that that's that's a real thing. And we have a lot more stress for kids than ever before. Last time they could play on their bicycles or whatever. Now it's like, you can't go outside because there's a pandemic. You're going to die if you go outside. So more stressful for kids. So it means that we need to understand that that's had an impact on the generation. So yeah, all that type of stuff. And the changing world of work. So as you, you probably have heard this, in a couple of years, in like 20 years or in 10 years, 60% of the jobs that will exist don't exist yet. 
right? So it means like, well, how do we prepare people for those? Because we don't even know what those jobs are. They don't exist yet. So like last time, it's like you just teach the kid how to be a farmer, and then the kid becomes a farmer. Now it's like, well, what do we do? How do we prepare kids for this type of future? Because we don't know exactly what the future holds. So it's more challenging. So it sounds great. Continuous professional development. You get all these people in a room, and you teach them, and everybody lives happily ever after. But is it really like that? No. Same like the internet. You, you give people the internet, great tool for learning, right? You've got the world's books at your fingertips, so much knowledge. I mean, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, right? Like, that's what we use it primarily for, even though, like, there's probably, I mean, there's not probably, there's definitely so much knowledge. And where do you find it? It's buried under, you know, terabytes of content of all kinds of other stuff. So let's talk about the challenges about developing teachers and developing education. It's expensive. Vietnam, Hanoi, public schools, Ho Chi Minh City, public schools, the countryside, public schools. Do they have a big budget to develop teachers? No, they don't. Imagine, right? Like. Some of these guys are not very familiar with computers. And then all of a sudden, OK, teach online. So that's a huge challenge. So it's expensive. Schools make a lot of investment, or do, you know, they try. They try to make the, the investment, but they don't necessarily know where that investment should go. Even when they have the money, measuring the achievement, measuring the, the the outcome is challenging. So there's the money side. They might not have the money, or they might not know how to spend the money effectively. Whoa, 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 whoa. Ineffective methods. So yeah, OK, great. Let's train teachers. Like we said, we got the money. Let's do it. Might not be effective. Might not work. And. Studies show that like, when you put people through these training things, not a lot of people demonstrate improvement. You know, I've done it. I've, I've had a couple of hundred people in a lecture hall and trained teachers and stuff like that for two weeks. But in reality, they're humans. And they, asking them to sit in a hall for eight hours, like by the end of it, most of them aren't there anymore. Right? Even though there was an investment. Just because it's like people don't have the bandwidth to be able to tolerate that type of stuff. Does that make sense? So it's not always effective. So that's another one of the challenges. And people don't always acknowledge or even recognize that they need to change. Teachers don't always know that they need to change. Okay? So. And then they might not want to. They might not recognize that there's a, there's a problem, or they might just not want to change. And that's the reality. You think about it like you take all these guys and you say, OK, guys, sorry, you have to teach online tomorrow. Well, I don't want to teach online. Teaching online doesn't work. It's not the same. It's not quite as good. Uh, you can't blah, blah, blah. There's this excuse, or there's that excuse. It shouldn't happen, blah, 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 blah. It's not going to work, blah, 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 blah. Hey, guys, guys, it's going to have to work. You're going to have to do it, right? So people don't like change. I'm sure you don't like change, or I don't like change. If you told me I have to change everything overnight, I'm not going to be happy, right? So that's one of the big challenges. When change comes from the top down, people especially don't like it, right? People need to buy into it in order to really want to change. Does that make sense? Cool. Any questions? Yes. Okay, good. Well, that's actually a whole other session. But I can give you 
I can give you some of the, some of the main points. First of all, you need to have some buy-in. You need to find some people who you can get on your side. It can't be a one-person show. And it never is a one-person show. You can always find some people who are your allies who can help promote a message. So there's the guy on the top. He can find, he's going to have to find people who he can bring onto his team, who can be like helping to promote the idea. But also, he's, the first thing is they've got to create the sense of urgency. So that means you need to make this really clear, that this is a serious problem that needs to be fixed right away. You need to articulate the problem, right? OK, we've got to teach online. Oh, but you know, I don't want to. I don't like it. Don't... Guys, we've got to do it. We're not sure how long we're going to do it. These kids need to continue. Oh, but, but. The world doesn't stop turning. We need to, we need to do it. Yeah, but I don't want to do it. We're going to do it. It's got to happen. We've got to do it within this week. We've got to start. Like that sense of urgency, that sense of commitment, and then also finding some people on your team who can spread the message like on the ground. Does that make sense? But I mean, there's actually eight points to that, but I could end up going off and talking about that for 10 hours, and we have just a few minutes. So resistance is another thing. I'll skip this one. So stages of development. So teachers already have a foundation when they become teachers. Engagement. So when the teachers leave school, leave university, right? They get into the classroom, they're starting to engage. I don't want to be the, all talking about teachers the whole thing, but I'm just trying to give you the context about the schools, how the schools are going to do the global citizenship education. Integration, blah, blah, blah. OK, engagement, let's just skip through it. Communities of practice. OK, so why am I talking about communities of practice? Communities of practice, traditionally, the way that they see it is it's a bunch of teachers sitting around sharing how they're dealing with these different challenges. OK, a community of practice, a bunch of teachers. You want them to start using technology, so what do you do? You bring them together in a room, if it's not COVID or whatever, right? You put them together in a room, you brainstorm, you share your best practice, you share things that are going well, what are the challenges, and you create a community of practice where people feel that they're not working by themselves, but they're part of a community. Okay, so that's what schools typically do, a community of practice. Novices and experienced practitioners. So it means that you have experienced teachers and you have new teachers. You have experienced people, you have new people. Not necessarily teachers in a community of practice, but experienced people, new people, sharing ideas, sharing their experiences towards trying to solve a problem. And that problem is usually about how to improve their practice, community of practice. They all practice the same thing. Right now we're talking about teachers, so what practice do they practice? Teaching. So three aspects of a community of practice, the community, the teachers, right? Like the people, they, they share something in common. The domain, the school, the practice, how it is that they teach. So they need to have all these th types of things in common. So now I want to talk about global citizenship education. So, I was just trying to give you an explanation about like where do schools come from and what are the challenges of doing this thing. And again, just to bring it back to what is the main point of this thing, everybody's complaining. Students, when they graduate from university, they don't have soft skills. So let's work directly with universities. OK, but again, going back to the source of the problem, kids are in university for four years. How long are they in elementary school? And prime or secondary school or in high school. Longer, right? And the, the direct communication from industry to school, very minimal, right? But then industry complains when there's not the output that they want from the universities. And global citizenship education is the economic thing, but it's also the social thing. I've heard UN women, I've been to UN women 
summit where they're talking about we need to work closer with universities so that when people graduate from universities they have a better appreciation for gender equality. Okay? Well, what about kindergarten? What about kindergarten to grade 12? Right? A lot can be done in that stage to address that problem. And we can skip over the university, or we can continue to work with the universities, obviously, but we can also start working directly from the people making the complaints to the schools to try to address that problem. Does that make sense? So, this is my school. Really big, really impressive. You guys would love it. You should visit. This guy has visited. This guy has visited it. How is it? Beautiful campus. Beautiful school. It's a great school. So here's our mission: to provide an outstanding education delivered in Vietnamese and English that emphasizes Vietnamese values, academic and personal excellence, and fosters global understanding, respect, and independent learning. You know why I love this school? I love this school because they don't just talk about global understanding. They're not just saying, we want to create global citizens. What do you see in there that you don't necessarily see in an international school thing? Is there anything in there that you don't necessarily see when it's an international school mission? Yeah, Vietnamese values. So in Vietnam, people don't necessarily want to sacrifice being Vietnamese, right? People should continue to be Vietnamese. What are the Vietnamese values? What are some Vietnamese values? I mean, just in general. Like, what are some things that like are things that are are meaningful? Honesty. Honesty. Okay. Yep. Good. Okay. Honesty can be a Vietnamese value. What else? Huh? Patriotism. Yeah. Absolutely. Patriotism. Definitely. When I first came to Vietnam, I couldn't believe how many times I could hear people say the word Vietnam in their just, when they're just talking. You know, like people just randomly drop in the word Vietnam into their conversation. What else? Family. Family. Very, very important. Are those things that should be sacrificed for a global understanding? No? You know, in, in Western countries, family isn't as important as it is in Vietnam, right? You don't necessarily want to sacrifice Vietnamese identity for global understanding. So in this school, it's a bilingual school, we still want people to be Vietnamese, we still want people to have the Vietnamese values, and we want the global understanding. But, first and foremost, Vietnamese values is, is, is there before global understanding. But still, global understanding is there, so it's, it's important. It's important for functioning, it's important for the world, it's important for Vietnam as it continues to develop. People need global understanding, but at the same time, Vietnamese values. So that's a little bit about the school. Bilingual school, two programs, international program, and the MOAT program, the Vietnamese program. So students have both the Vietnamese culture, they have the Vietnamese teachers, they have the international teachers, they have a combination. Very fast growing school, 1,500 kids in four years. Vietnamese, emerging middle class families. It's not, you know, the exclusive international school families. It's more accessible, reasonable tuition fees, excellent facilities. What else? Um, again, growth, 28%. Families like it. Families don't necessarily want to sacrifice the Vietnamese values for the global understanding. They want both. And, um, yeah, students graduate with two diplomas, and they have Vietnamese teachers and international teachers. So just to give you an idea about the school. So with that, you can imagine there can be some challenges, right? How do foreigners understand Vietnamese values? Right? Everybody has to follow a mission. The mission is what the organization is about. So. Expats, foreigners, understand the idea of global citizenship education. They don't necessarily understand Vietnamese values. On the flip side, fresh graduates from Vietnamese universities who are teachers don't necessarily understand global citizenship. 
education, right? So that's some of the challenges. Then you have to work, you have to create the partnership between both of these teachers, right? Because they have to share that mission. So that can be a challenge. Uh, this is an important thing, and I hope that if there's anybody out there on the internet watching from universities, one of the challenges is universities really only engage with schools to recruit students. They don't really talk to schools about like what are the things that schools can be doing, right? They don't really talk about like what are the things they can be doing to support schools, but it's like a transaction. A lot of it is a transaction. Universities trying to recruit students, and then businesses trying to recruit graduates. But there has to be a dialogue. You know, that's basically the conclusion of my speech, and I'm not actually finished, but that's the main thing that I'm trying to get to, is that there's got to be a dialogue because universities can contribute to what it is that schools are teaching. Schools can tell universities what are some of the challenges that they can anticipate when students leave school and enter university. And businesses can talk to schools directly to say what are the things that schools can be fostering in order to develop global citizens. And right now, it's not like that. It's businesses complain, universities complain, schools complain. Businesses complain that graduates don't have the soft skills. Universities complain that students don't have these skills and that skills or whatever. And I'm complaining that universities don't engage with schools enough to talk about what it is that we can be doing to supporting them. And they don't do enough to support schools. Right? So I think this is the type of thing. And also, I mean, again, businesses can engage. Organizations, not just businesses, can engage directly with schools in order to make sure that the curriculum is relevant. Who writes the curriculums? Some guy in England behind the desk with the book, right? Looking at stuff. Intelligent, definitely. But not necessarily engaging directly with businesses. And not necessarily understanding what are the challenges specific to different countries in the world, right? So those are some of the challenges. So how do we try to fix this? This is where I, I, I talked and talked and talked about continuing professional development. Now you understand why I talked about it, because this is one of the ways in which we're going to try to fix this problem, is we're going to make it continuous, subject of discussion, and continuous focus for the teachers. A mission statement is something that's really important. A lot of organizations don't really know what their mission statement is. If you ask a random person, they don't necessarily know it. We're trying to make the mission statement really central. And we're trying, to under, we're trying to underline that global understanding part of the mission statement so people know that, yeah, OK, we've got to make global understanding a big part of what it is that we do, in addition to the Vietnamese values. right? So how do we do that? We do that continuous professional development. It means training teachers about global understanding, about global citizenship, right? getting them doing workshops, exchanging ideas about what does global citizenship mean to them, how can we promote it? How can we engage students with people from around the world? That type of stuff. Practical solutions, not just theory. OK? So equipping teachers with different toolkits, different lessons that they can use, different resources that they can access in order to try to emphasize this point for kids. Does that make sense? So after all that talking, now you know why I spent all this time talking about continuous professional development, because that's what we're trying to do. So the other thing is that we have a diverse bunch of teachers from around the world, right? They're not all from England. They're not all from Canada. They're not all from the US. They're not all from South Africa. They're not all from the Philippines. They're from all over the place, right? And that is what global citizenship is about. You don't want to have just some American guy's perspective about global citizenship. You need to have a very rich understanding of it. And that's why you need to bring a whole bunch of people together and discuss it, right? Discuss it and share their ideas. And also, we talked about like when it's top down, people don't like it. When I tell you, do this, do this, do this, you don't like it, right? People don't like to be told what to do. 
like we were saying, right? How do you in, how do you do change when people don't want to be when the people don't like it? Well, the big solution is to make them part of it. Okay, guys. So, what are the solutions? How can we do this better? How can we promote global citizenship? Tell me. Work in a group and find some solutions. It's different than I'm saying, guys, global citizenship, do it like this, do it like that, do it like this, okay? Does that make sense, guys? Cool. Are you starting to get bored? Are you sure? Promise? Okay. Okay, so here is the big thing that I did. And I told you, like, I told you a little bit about myself, and I said, this presentation is not about me, blah, blah, blah. Right? Okay, but it is a little bit about me because I bring a little bit of a different experience. And I shared with you, like, I, I, I originally studied to be a school teacher in Canada, and I did an MBA, then I became board member of Eurocham and blah, blah, blah. Right? So, Different perspective. So when I'm talking about these things, I'm thinking like, how can we make this really practical? How can we separate it from the guy in the England who's sitting behind the desk writing the curriculum, which is really good and everything like that? And how can we adapt it specifically for Vietnam, specifically for these challenges that the guy from the UN and uh, higher education and ASA, all these people are talking about, the challenges of the deficit between the skills graduates need and what companies are getting from those people, right? Okay, so let's engage directly with the industries and let's engage directly with the universities. So that's what we've started doing this year at Amassi. We've created an industry advisory board. Okay, so an industry advisory board means we will engage directly with businesses, with a board of business leaders and organizational leaders of different levels, right? not all CEOs, to get input about how can we do this better and how can we make it more relevant, okay? So that's very unique, very different from what other schools do because they follow the curriculum, right? They work with universities for recruitment, right? So that students will go, but they don't actually ask them to, okay, guys, what can we do? Okay, give us some suggestions. How can we make this better? So this is what we're doing. We're working with an industry advisory board. And our school is about Vietnamese values and global understanding. That means it shouldn't be just a bunch of expats telling us, do it like this, do it like that. You guys are doing this wrong. You guys are doing that wrong. We need Vietnamese people on the board as well, right? Saying, OK, this is not being done right. You can emphasize this part more, blah, blah, blah. OK? So we have a diverse industry advisory board. Does that make sense? So, yes, sir. Sorry? A specific what? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, have a, we have something we call the Graduate Ready Program. So these people come in and speak directly to the students. Every month we have a workshop with different speaker from industry, different stages of their career, talking about their experience, talking about the challenges that they've had, giving advice about what they would suggest or what they hoped or wished somebody had told them when they were that age to be able to be more successful and to be able to adapt to the challenges. So we do. But more than that, we don't just want those people to be having a 45-minute workshop with a bunch of kids once a month. We want them to be having ongoing conversations with the teachers. The teachers can send a message and say, oh, can you take a look at this and give, give us your feedback? And I don't want to overload a busy CEO or whatever with like 50 page curriculum document. I just want it to be like, okay, this is an overview of what it is that we're doing. What are some things that you would suggest that we do differently? Or this is the code, like this is what the curriculum says. It says like, do some coding or whatever. Like, what would you say is the most relevant platform for coding for the future, for the, uh, for, the, for the outlook, for the next 15 years? Is there anything that you would recommend based on your expertise? Yeah, I would recommend that you use this one. Okay, cool, we'll use that one, okay? So it's about getting, making sure that the teachers have kind of a hotline directly to experts in the industry 
So it's not just, okay, let's follow what's on the paper, but it's like, okay, so let's look at the paper, let's see what adaptations we can make based on the advice of our industry advisory board. Does that make sense? Cool. Yes. First and foremost, very impressive idea. I mean, like to bring on the industry advisory board is something uh, for the first time in my life I heard about it when you apply for a high school. But what is the value that you can bring to the to the board? I mean, to the CEO or the senior members to make them like go on the journey with you because not sure. many people will go with the university because they have direct value like internship. Uh, from the student or branding for the company they are working for, but what what are like the values for them if they join a board for a high school like MSc? Cool, good question. The answer is, I mean, if you're going to complain that people don't have the skills that you want, what are you going to do to be part of the solution? I'm also a very convincing guy and I have a good network, right? So like I said, like if I've been on the board of Eurocham twice or whatever and I've been on the board of BritChamp, I can, I can easily engage with people and I can easily sell the idea. I was like, okay, so you are saying people are graduating without these skills. So let's work together to make sure that fewer people are graduating without those skills. And so far we've been very successful. I think also organizations have this concept of CSR. And CSR isn't always about bringing a big check, right? And giving it to people in the mountains or whatever. Sometimes it's about, okay, engaging with schools to improve the quality of education. And the quality of education is maybe not the right term. The relevance of the education, making sure that it's relevant. And for it to be relevant, there needs to be that partnership. So I'll give you a really quick, because I know we're out of time give you a really quick idea of who is our advisory board. So ICT, ICT, we are Cambridge School and we're a bilingual school, so we have the MOET program as well. Okay, cool. I'm not convinced that either one of those organizations really directly engage with industry when it comes to ICT, okay? I know that those guys are experts in their fields, but we work directly with uh, Deloitte, which is always coming out with reports and studies about the future of employment and the future of technology. So we work directly with their regional director to find out what is the advice that they can share. We work with uh, the head of computer games design at University of Bolton. So that way we can get ideas about like, why do we, how do we engage with these students, right? How do we, how do we make sure that what we're doing is relevant and how do we give them the skills so that they will stand out and be successful in university with the technical skills that they're gonna need, okay? Graduate ready program, I talked a little bit about that. How do we prepare students with the soft skills, right? Relevant for business, for international employment, for local employment. We work with British University of Vietnam. We work with the British Chamber of Commerce, big network of people who can tell us directly like what are the challenges they have in terms of the skills deficit that they experience for local graduates in Vietnam. Does that make sense? Global perspectives is a subject from Cambridge. It's about like global citizenship, basically. Who do we work with? We work with our connection at the UNDP. So that's a mid-level manager based in Bangkok from Vietnam, Vietnamese national, giving insight into what are the parts of global citizenship that she feels we should emphasize for the Vietnamese student because it might be different from what a kid in Tibet is needing to learn. It might be different from what a kid in London needs to learn, right? So we work directly with that. Science, AstraZeneca. We talk directly to the regional director for AstraZeneca for big picture ideas about what it is that we can do. We doesn't read through the whole curriculum document, right, and check every learning. He just looks at the thing and says, okay, I think you can do this. I think you can maybe emphasize this part. We can send support. We can get a guest speaker about that, blah, blah, blah. English, we work with James Cook University in Singapore. 
just to give some insights about how we can improve our English program. So basically, about working directly with universities and businesses, engaging them, so it's not just a transaction where we send people over to them, and that's the end of the story. But making sure that they're telling us what they need, and we're telling them what we need, and we're trying to serve each other for the benefit of who? For the benefit of the students, and for the benefit of society, so that the students are learning what they need, and can succeed, and society can grow and be successful. I think that's the perfect way to end it. Okay? Yeah, so what's the conclusion? How do we measure it? We've measured it with student satisfaction surveys. Bear in mind we're only four years old. No, we just had our first graduating cohort, so we can't really track the progress to the full extent, right? Um, we've measured it by teacher surveys about what is their understanding, their confidence level about global citizenship, surveys of the families about their confidence in the school in terms of how they feel we're doing, and also the feedback from, uh, from our industry advisory board. Any questions? Yes. Um, two points. So one just uh, with my perspective. Uh, maybe as a high school student in a traveling high school, which is the weird concept. Traveling high school? That's why it's a real school, it's not a high school. Although we don't have a campus. But anyway, um, I think that with my experience of being a high school in Vietnam and also blowing, going global, what I recognize in, in the potential of high school students in Vietnam is that they do have the potential to contribute to the companies or um, let's say graduating institutions directly. I've seen you know high school students doing research with a professor or doing their intern that directly contribute to the values of the company. So I think that yes, of course, it's um, you know it's also coming from the company that they are helping the students. But um, on the other hand, there is also something that high school students can contribute to to institutions and enterprise. Um, and okay, the second point is my questions to you is that um, as a student in uh, so in my school just a little bit it's like a project based learning high school and so what we do is that we do projects instead of doing like regular traditional subjects and I per personally I found it an amazing um, and it's very fascinating uh, models of education. Uh, where do you think uh, how do you think like the roles of project based learning in bridging the gap between college, um, college uh, companies and the schools, because from my side, I personally think it's great because you're giving the students the choice. Because as we do projects, we have to step out, we have to talk to companies. Like so, basically, what the work that you and your advisory board are doing, the students is also doing it. So, do you see it as a contribution and as an opportunity for students to contribute in that process? Those are excellent questions. Um, for me, the first okay. Let me let me just some let me just go back. So the first point wasn't really a question, right? The first point was a statement, and I agree with you. I agree with you. There's a lot that you know, that high school students can contribute to businesses. For my school, before we do that, I want to be very confident that those kids have the skills, so they will reflect well on the school. Because it would be very easy to damage a relationship with an organization by sending unprepared students to be interns, right? Because that would be a very short-lived experiment. Now, in the long-term vision, absolutely, we want to be able to do that. But before we do that, we need to be confident that we can do it well. And that's basically the theme for the second answer, or the second question, project-based learning. I'm also a big fan of project-based learning on the condition that it's done well. For me, my school, the context that I've shared, we're in our fourth year. We've had rapid growth, 28% year-on-year growth. Big numbers, good positive word of mouth. It's not, uh, we're not, you haven't even heard of us, right? But who's heard of us? the friends and families of our current students. That speaks more than it's like we're not selling something on TV. Like we're being sold by the people who already bought the product. Okay? So when it comes to project-based learning, yeah, absolutely. 
I'm all for it. But again, it's got to be done well. And until I'm very confident that we do the basics well, I don't want to get overly creative and be too avant-garde. So for me, just as a, like, just for your reference, apart from like engaging industry, what we really want to do in the next couple of years is consolidate what it is that we do. Be very confident that we are doing the basics, the fundamentals, really, really well. And once we're very confident that we're doing the basics and the fundamentals really, really well, then absolutely we will make sure that we're taking it to the next level, which is the project-based learning, sending students into the businesses, and all that other type of stuff like that. But as a baby step, getting the students to engage, interact with the business leaders is, is one important step. The guest speakers, getting the teachers to engage directly with the organizations to get direct feedback about what are the things that can be done to improve it. How do we keep this relevant? How do we make adjustments so that it's specific to the needs of Vietnamese kids, this international curriculum? That's the type of thing that we're, that's the stage that we're at right now. But absolutely, I mean, on the theme of continuous professional development, like there's no finish line. Once we reach this point, the finish line moves further. How do we get better? So right now, it's just about having a solid, firm foundation. But great question. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry. Uh, before you have mentioned that university and high school are not working properly together, uh, university are only like uh, come to high school to require uh, recruit uh, students. So I want to ask, like, how can university collaborate with high school to level, uh, develop more of the CPT program? Because before I study in the UK, so in even before my A level in my GCSE, I have been consult what I want to do in my university. But most of the students in Vietnam, they just they kind of like uh, when they come to year twelve, they start to thinking about that what they want to do for the university. So when they come to university, they will start to explore like, oh, what uh, I'm gonna do with my degree or something, and then they want to train their degree afterwards. I think like career consultant in university is already too late. So I think we should uh, have more of career, career consultant in high school where students before they choosing their degree. So in your opinion, what do you think that university can do more, work more with uh, high school to engage that? Yeah, so I mean, just to clarify, I. I don't mean to say that all universities and all schools, it's not, I'm not saying like absolute terms. I'm saying generally speaking, it, it does seem to be more of a transaction where schools are feeders into universities. Now, how can universities and schools work more effectively together? I mean, dialogue, more engage, direct engagement. So schools and universities meeting, right? and talking not just about how do we get students into your university. Because it does benefit a school when a student from that school goes to this university because it's, it's prestige, right? Like if a kid from my school goes to Oxford or Cambridge or whatever, like for sure, that's great for my school. But, I mean, how do we engage with universities to know what are the things that we can be preparing our students with, not just for their application, right? but for them to actually succeed once they're in university, and also for them to listen from schools about what can they expect, what type of challenges can they anticipate from the different groups of students, the different generations of students. So to answer the question, I think you know, the university counselor is really important. And the university counselor does engage with universities. And a lot of the time, it's about how do we get the student into the university. And of course, the university wants the student to succeed in the university. But I think that the, the, beyond the transaction of students to specific universities is the big picture cooperation about like, OK, what's good for society? Like, how do we, what skills do universities, like a panel of universities, meeting with a panel of teachers or a panel of school leaders feel need to be developed? Does that make sense? OK, cool. Yes. 
Uh, so I also have another two points. First of all, I want to add a additional view to the answer of, uh, for him. Like he asked that, uh, what, um, like, uh, what the business can gain value from like the other uh, 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 free of school? Like uh, they uh, can uh, get uh, gain revenue from university, like the internship, or the uh, or they can hire the employees from uh, university in uh, directly after they graduate. So why do we, why do they need to you know uh, invest in other you know stage of uh, school like secondary school and high school? And I think that it is not for the um, uh, immediate result. It is not for the um, like it's not immediate result because uh, I have searched for a term that's CSR because many businesses right now they have the corporate responsibility. So I think that they are looking for the long term development. So I think they're still willing to invest in uh, primary school and secondary school in order to uh, like uh, uh, like to maintain the uh, sustainable uh, the, uh, sustainable development for the uh, uh, for Vietnam. And my question is that you have um, in the final part you have mentioned the uh, uh, solution for the teacher, like they can uh, participate in some workshop to uh, to uh, cultivate their knowledge about the uh, global skill, right? So uh, I want to ask that, um, how can we make sure that their workshop can be effective? Because I mentioned above, uh, because uh, even when the teachers are trained, you said that uh, the training are not very ineffective, are very ineffective, and they are resist when they have to absorb something new. And also that the majority of Vietnamese teacher right now are middle aged, that it's really hard to change the perception of how to be Okay, so I think it goes back to the point that I was making about communities of practice. So when it's top down, when it's me saying do this, there's resistance. When it's, when it's the leadership team saying, okay guys, let's find solutions together. Let's create communities of practice. You guys work together, you exchange your ideas, you bring ideas to us. That's getting buy-in. That's a big important part of dealing with that resistance because it's not being enforced on them. It's in partnership with them. It's a community of practice. So the community of practice goes beyond just a bunch of teachers in a room exchanging our ideas, but it's a bunch of teachers in, the, in a room exchanging ideas, collecting ideas, collecting questions, engaging the leadership team and engaging industry in order to come up with solutions or to exchange ideas. I mean, there's no shortage of possibilities for them of how they can do that. I mean, they can they can exchange practice. They can read case studies. They can uh, watch videos of it. They can read articles. You know, there's I mean, professional development. They can do online courses. There's there's all kinds. Of, you give a person a certificate. It's also a good motivator. But there's all kinds of ways in which professional development takes place in the education sphere. It's not just workshops uh, like with people sitting in a classroom taking notes about listening to a speaker. But it's a workshops can take the form of, like we said, exchanging ideas, different people presenting each week, you know, guest speakers coming in, the industry advisory board, for example, coming in is much more impactful than listening to me say it, right? Like, I can say the same message, but if the guy from AstraZeneca comes in and says the message, I mean, it's got a lot of weight, right? So I think that's one of the ways in which we address it. I think you're absolutely right, too, about what you said earlier. Um, businesses do want to engage in CSR. They do want to be part of sustainable development. They are thinking about the long term. And that the benefits are that, like, you know, like there doesn't need to be a measurable outcome within one year, like financially. It's about like being part of a long-term development. And for, you know, like if I put on the Eurocham hat for a second, the EVFTA, the European Vietnam Free Trade Agreement, it has a lot of emphasis on sustainable development. 
it says businesses in Vietnam, European businesses in Vietnam, and the Vietnamese government need to work in collaboration towards sustainable development. So I mean that's also something that is putting the onus on both parties to improve sustainable development. So they do have that type of requirement to do that. They do have that sense of responsibility. And they might not necessarily know how, how to do that. But if a school is engaging them and reaching out to them and saying, oh, can we possibly discuss some aspects of our curriculum, like big picture type of things about like what are some of the, out, the learning objectives that we could be working towards, or what are some of the challenges that you were experiencing that we can support with, and blah, blah, blah. That's a good first step. So not necessarily measured in financial benefit terms, not necessarily immediate, like, okay, so how many students are you going to send to me if I do this? But more like, okay, so we're going to work together. And, and I mean, an industry advisory board, for a person, I mean, to say that they're a part of an industry advisory board is also a benefit for them, too, because it shows that, like, you know, their career spans beyond just their office, but also engaging in the community. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So I just want to say, so I just want to say thank you uh, for your answers to all the audience here. I believe that you know some of you may still have some questions for um, Josh, but unfortunately we're running out of time, so I'm going to give him um, you know like contact and reach out later. So you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, so once again, I would like to thank you for today, <coughs> with us today. I believe that that has concluded our morning session but, um, uh, in Knowledge Room. You know, we would like to invite everyone back to the inquiry room so that we can participate in our concluding remarks. Um, and once again, on behalf of our organizing committee, we would like to thank you, um, everyone, for joining uh, CBDC, Exploring Boundaries for Global Citizens. Thank you. <laughs>